So was the snake in Genesis 3 just a snake? Or was it a snake and something more? So Michael Jones over at Inspiring Philosophy, he argues that the serpentine being in Genesis 3 was similar to the kind of heavenly beings praising Yahweh that Isaiah sees in his vision in Isaiah chapter 6. But unlike Isaiah chapter 6, the serpentine heavenly being in Genesis 3 was in the midst of rebellion. And by the end of this video, you'll be able to summarize why by walking through these nine points. So I'm synthesizing two arguments from two different videos, one from Michael Heiser and the other from Michael Jones at Inspiring Philosophy. I'll put a link to those fuller discussions below, but here's the breakdown. So number one, Heiser asks, was the Apostle John correct in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, when he referred to the serpent in Genesis 3 as the devil and Satan? And of course, the answer is yes, the Apostle John was correct. But the big question for us is, why was he correct? And we can't just say because he was a New Testament author. What we want to know is, how does John arrive at this conclusion? And the answer is, he knew his Old Testament really well. So step number two, and this question also comes from Heiser. He asks, does the author of Genesis 3 intend to impart lost zoological information? So for example, does the author really want us to know that snakes used to have legs, but now they don't? And Heiser says that this is ridiculous and it's kind of cartoonish. Now, this is just me inferring, but I think he's kind of throwing shade at answers in Genesis here. If you didn't know, they have these exhibits where they try to recreate different scenes from Genesis 1 through 11, and the fall is one of them. But the answer here is no. The author's purpose was not to impart lost zoological information, and the Apostle John knew this as well. And this leads us to step number three. We want to get into the mind of the ancient biblical authors, or better yet, we want to get the ancient writers into our minds. Now, we've already said that the Apostle John connected the dots between the serpent and in Satan because he knew his Old Testament well. So let's see if we can connect the dots right along with him. So step number four, Heiser argues that Nechash, the word for serpent in Genesis 3, is a triple entendre, meaning it has triple meaning. So it could be rendered as serpent, deceiver, or the shining one. Step number five, serpent and shining one link to the seraphim in Isaiah's vision in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2. Commentators often interpret seraphim to mean burning ones, but they're also serpentine, right? They were these large winged serpent-like heavenly beings who were praising Yahweh. But now we have to go back to Genesis. So step number six, Michael Jones argues that the word other isn't inherent in the original Hebrew. So read Genesis chapter three, verse one, the ESV says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. So what this translation could imply is that the serpent is merely another beast of the field that God had made, but nothing more than that. But the argument here is the serpent of the field is a serpent, but he's also more than that. So point number seven, God curses the serpent, but the curse isn't what you think. So in Genesis chapter three, verse 14, God says, on your belly, you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Two points here. Michael argues that on your belly doesn't mean that God removed the snake's limbs. Instead, it signifies the fact that God is sending the serpent away in a humble or docile position. Second, the phrase, and dust you shall eat, doesn't imply diet. Instead, Michael argues that this curse is similar to our phrase, bit the dust. So the point is God is cursing the serpent to crash and burn and to eventually die. So here's what Michael argues. He says that the serpent in Genesis 3 is the same kind of serpentine heavenly being seen in Isaiah's vision in Isaiah chapter 6. So when God curses the serpent in Genesis 3, what's happening is, is that this serpentine being is being cast down and out of God's divine heavenly counsel. So point number eight, Isaiah and Ezekiel describe the judgment of rebellious earthly kings with the language of Genesis 3. So check out Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 through 20 and Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 12 through 19. Point being, later biblical authors talk about these later rebellions by replaying the notes and the melody of the first rebellion all the way back in the garden. So last but not least, point number nine, Michael argues that the parallels between Genesis 3, Isaiah 6, Isaiah 14, and Ezekiel 28 clarify what's going on with the serpent 
all the way back in Genesis 3. Maybe a better way to say this is these four passages clarify how the biblical authors thought about the event all the way back in Genesis 3. They saw a serpentine heavenly being being cast out of God's presence. And all of this leads us back to the Apostle John's comments in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. He understood that the snake was a member of God's divine counsel, but he was in rebellion against God. So God judges that serpent just like he judges later earthly kings, right? He humbles him and sends him away destined to die. And so the promise of Genesis 3 gives us hope for that day when a human will come from the woman's offspring, crush the head of the serpent, and achieve victory once and for all over God's enemies. There's a lot more to learn, so like this video, and then we'll see you guys in the next one.